See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. There are a lot of things out there that are hazards, increasing social unrest and violence, devastating natural disasters, greenhouse gases, and rising sea levels and rising sea temperatures, the nuclear dangers of a uh, growing arms race again across the world. Part of functioning on a day-to-day -day basis is in part our ability to deny that some of these catastrophic risks exist and that they have the potential to create such chaos and disharmony and even bad health outcomes for populations. They're not as rare and infrequent as most humans would like to believe they are. The good news is that we are incredibly resilient and very resourceful, and we have brilliant scientists and people working within public health and within the other related arenas to help protect human health. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. Necessity is often credited with being the mother of invention. And perhaps her twin sister is disaster. In the midst of a disaster, in the disruption, the devastation, drama and despair, when things fall apart and systems collapse, when property is destroyed, lives are threatened, supply chains are broken, and the rescue crews are still on their way, innovation actually flourishes because it just has to. In this episode, we meet disaster head on by visiting with a scholar and innovator who spends all her waking hours and some sleepless nights considering the science, technology, and innovations that are being deployed to strengthen health systems, build community resilience, and protect national security. My name is Tenor Goodwin Venema, and I am currently a contributing scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, which is an amazing place, kind of a think tank within the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where I am fortunate enough to work with some incredibly brilliant and wonderful people who have actually, for many, many years, been looking at global catastrophic catastrophic biological risks, such as pandemics and bioterrorism and other sort of horrible biological events, and trying to do a better job of helping the United States healthcare system and public health system be prepared to respond to those types of events. So in terms of my background, I am a pediatric nurse practitioner as my clinical background and worked for many, many years in emergency departments. I have been a professor of nursing and public health for many years, um, but I think my greatest joys are being a scientist and trying to do a better job of understanding the impact of disasters and public health emergencies on healthcare systems. And then um, I've done a lot of work uh, in terms of workforce readiness, helping nurses, helping physicians, helping allied healthcare providers be prepared for global catastrophic biological events. And we certainly know that these events are not one-offs. This may be the worst public health emergency that we've had in over 100 years, but it won't be the last one. And it's happening simultaneously with flooding, the polar vortex, wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes. It's a dynamic and challenging world that we all live in now. And we're going to be faced to dealing with it for a long time to come. Yeah, we are. I was going to say throughout time, we've had disasters. It certainly seems like there are more of them. They're coming at us faster with less time to recover and to reset and respond. So my question to you, Tanner, why disaster? That, I mean, what about it draws you to it? Out of all of the things that you can do, this is incredibly stressful and it takes 
for the people who are responding and thinking about it, I would imagine it's hard to sleep at night. First of all, you're right. It is hard to sleep at night. (laughs) And I can't say I've ever really been a good sleeper. You know, I don't know if that was an outgrowth of my work or it just helped me get a lot of work done because I had more awake hours. But interestingly enough, many, many, many years ago, I was working as a triage nurse in the emergency department at Straw Memorial Hospital, which is up in Rochester, New York. And I went to my mailbox and there was a book that was sent to me from the, what was then at the time, the Institute of Medicine. And it was on chemical and biological warfare. I have absolutely no idea why I, as a nurse, registered nurse at that point, received the book, but I took it home and I read it cover to cover. And uh, throughout the book, it mentioned, you know, the impact these events would have on emergency departments and on the healthcare workforce. And I talked to my physician colleagues and my nursing colleagues, and nobody really had any idea of what we would have to do should any of these events occur. And so I really kind of just started reading voraciously myself and uh, was a bit of an autodidact and just sort of taught myself a lot about disaster preparedness, public health emergency management, the incident command system, the concepts of the disaster life cycle, and what type of burden it has on healthcare systems. And I don't know, the work just kind of spiraled from there. And then 9-11 hit. And at that point, I was already a professor at the university, was teaching and doing research, and was shocked and devastated as everyone else was. And uh, I remember watching the planes, uh, you know, go into the World Trade Center and canceling class and going back into my office and that just spent the rest of the day drafting an outline for a book on the topic and emailed it to three publishers. And when I came in the next morning, Two of them had already responded with an offer to work with me to publish a book uh, on disaster nursing and chemical and biological and radiological terrorism. And so it just kind of took off from there. That just sounds so ominous, but you're probably a really good person to help us understand disasters. It's becoming pretty clear that they're not as rare and infrequent as I think most humans would like to believe they are. I mean, part of functioning on a day-to-day basis and being positive and happy and going to work and living our daily lives is, is in part our ability to deny that some of these catastrophic risks exist and that they have the potential to create such chaos and disharmony and even bad health outcomes for populations. So my whole career, I have worked to try to better understand these events in terms of metrics. The science regarding climate change is certainly unequivocal, and we are seeing more and more evidence on a yearly basis of the impact of greenhouse gases and rising sea levels and rising sea temperatures and what that's doing in terms of the increase in some of these devastating natural disasters. And then at the end of the day, humans are not always as genuine and altruistic as we would hope there would be. And so humans make mistakes. They may have some malintentions. We're witnessing increasing social unrest and violence within the United States itself, in addition to the nuclear dangers of a growing arms race again across the world. So the reality is there are a lot of things out there that are hazards, meaning they have the potential to create an event that will have negative health outcomes for communities and the people who live in them. And yet at the same time, the good news is that we are incredibly resilient and very resourceful, and we have brilliant scientists and people working within public health and within the other related arenas to help protect human health. And that's become part of our national security. Yes, there are some days where I find my work overwhelming and 
onerous and you're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to make it through this day? But for the most part, I'm actually a huge optimist and I'm challenged to find solutions to help improve the way we do things. And of course, to constantly take the lessons we've learned from all the events that we've been through, whether it was Katrina or Superstorm Sandy or the California wildfires or what happened with the polar vortex in Texas, all within the context of a global pandemic and say, what lessons are we learning? What do we need to fix and what can we do better next time around? I want to pick up on two words that you used, security and resilience. So at the Johns Hopkins, the Center for Health Security, where you and a brilliant group of folks with expertise in science, medicine, public health, nursing, economics, national security, you guys are on a mission really to protect people's health from epidemics, pandemics, disasters. But really where you have been is ensuring that communities are resilient to the major challenges. It sounds as though you've embraced the idea, these happen, they are a part of natural cycles, we will have them happen. So can you describe this center, the team that's there, and then where do you start? Because I can only imagine you guys are just on warp speed at the moment and have been probably for well over a year at this point. Well, the center is truly uh, an amazing place to work and I think a shining star in terms of the contributions that my colleagues have made throughout the pandemic and long before that. The center was started by D.A. Henderson, who's a very, very famous physician and public health official who actually helped eradicate smallpox from the planet many, many years ago. We have an amazing team of research analysts who, without their work, uh, we wouldn't be able to conduct the research and write the policy and the reports and the recommendations we do. And then, of course, just being housed within the broader context of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health is amazing. The work of many of our colleagues at Hopkins who've established the COVID-19 tracking map and our COVID-19 resource page, we have a COVID call almost every morning to review our projects, to keep each other informed, to glean what's happening and what's in the mass media, what is happening at the White House within the task force. We have really strong connections to the CDC. And what I really love the most about my colleagues is we're all constantly learning. We're trying to find more information to answer some of these wicked problems in terms of, you know, how do you stop a global pandemic? How do you change people's behaviors and get them to understand that the science, if used properly, can end this pandemic within a few weeks? So it's a wonderful place to work. We've done projects everywhere from looking at the impact of the pandemic on the healthcare workforce to a project that is going on now, the Communivax Coalition, which is a research-based project to really empower communities of color where there has been some historic vaccine hesitancy, but to rather than just look at how do we get more vaccines into people, how do we empower the communities to have a voice in all of their healthcare decisions and basically view it as a step to recovery and strengthening and building resilience within those communities. The COVID tracking project, that must be the most visited site for us to really understand the data, the numbers. How did that COVID tracking project and our understanding of the spread of the disease across the globe, how did that fall to Johns Hopkins? Johns Hopkins scientists and scholars were just perfectly positioned to rise up to the challenge of having to collect, aggregate, analyze, and present data in a meaningful way that would inform public health officials, hospital administrators, federal agencies, and even at times improve the quality of the data that was coming out of the CDC. So just the right people so committed 
to using science and solid epidemiology and understanding of pandemics to try to improve access to those public health interventions that we know make a difference. We have pushed masking, uh, the science behind masking and respiratory protection, the science behind socially distancing, improving air quality in schools and indoor settings such as restaurants. We're running a number of studies looking at how do we improve the proper use of personal protective equipment in emergency department settings. And we're doing another study on the mental health impact and support needs of not only physicians and nurses as part of the COVID-19 response, but environmental health service workers, dietitians, nutrition staff, housekeeping and security. There is no one who has lived through the past 12 months in the United States who has not been impacted by this pandemic. And so we're really focused on how do we promote health, wellness, mental health, well-being in the midst of a protracted global pandemic that has just witnessed its 500 thousand death. As you mentioned, you're using this to inform governments at all levels, to inform health systems, to inform the public. We're speaking very specifically about COVID, but how are data and technology really transforming the preparation and the response to any type of a disaster? The future and the innovations that we're seeking are to apply technology, everything from educational technology to clinical decision support at the point of care to looking at how do we revolutionize the design and delivery of healthcare systems and services during disasters and public health emergencies to ensure that there is no gaps in care. The disaster nursing app was something that I developed back in 2015 for nurses to be able to access valid, reliable scientific data to drive their decision making during these types of disasters or any type of public health emergency event, everything from a toxic food outbreak to emerging infectious disease outbreaks. And so I partnered with Unbound Medicine. I had drafted out the templates of what I wanted the app to look like. And we actually cover over 404 different types of disasters with hopefully valuable information that if somebody loses all their water and has to understand where am I going to get water, how do I purify it, how many gallons a day per person, per family member should I be planning for, that we could really provide that evidence. And so the app became very timely and we updated it as new emerging infectious diseases took place. We added Zika, Ebola, and then of course the COVID-19 pandemic. We ended up making the app available free of charge to every nursing student in the United States so that they would have some source of easy to access information that they could use right from the get-go and getting used to accessing that information while they were in school so that they would continue to understand how to use app-driven content to help them in their professional practice. Moving beyond that, in the broader disaster preparedness and public health emergency response world, I have seen so many wonderful examples of the use of technology. I mean, certainly the most obvious one has been the major pivot to telehealth and e-visits that we've had to do, particularly as it relates to the delivery of primary care and mental health. Yeah. Uh, so when we think about how we have really disrupted the sort of traditional model of the patient gets in the car or on the bus, travels to either the physician's office or the hospital clinic, waits in the waiting room, goes in and is then seen by the provider, that had to end early on. What we have seen is that telehealth can be used broadly, incredibly effectively. In some ways, it has improved patient care services in certain types of settings. And patients really, really like 
like that. And of course, the things that we saw had to happen in COVID-19 were testing, contact tracing, counseling patients, educating them on what isolation is, what quarantine is, what does that mean for the people they live with, when can they safely return to work, and then of course now the vaccine implementation program. So we have experienced a million lessons coming together all at the same time that I do believe we will learn from and be able to improve our healthcare systems going forward. We've heard about making sure that ventilators are in certain places, that PPE gets moved to certain places, ICU nurses, you know, moving them all around. We see that's happening, but there's a huge amount of logistics and technology on the on the back end, you know, um, under the hood that we don't really see. How do we do that? How do we get the resources to the places that we need? And I'm thinking all of the field hospitals that we've had to put together, the pop-up testing centers, and now we're doing mass vaccination centers where we're just completely mobilizing every type of resource to take the care where it needs to be. Can you walk through how that actually unfolds and what innovations are supporting that level of responsiveness and mobility? Well, you've asked a really large question, a really important question, and unfortunately, there's not really one succinct answer to that. And the challenge lies in the fact that there are 50 different states with 50 different health departments and different rules and regulations and laws that govern how healthcare is organized and delivered in those locations. And so each state has unfortunately uh, had to stand kind of on its own base throughout the pandemic, given the absence of federal guidance uh, in many respects throughout this. When it comes to vendor supply chains for PPE, there are a lot of initiatives going on to ensure a more robust and redundant vendor supply chain so that we have access to adequate personal protective equipment. But in terms of how is all of this organized, and when we talk about setting up what we would describe as alternative care sites and staffing them, it really does fall back on the hospitals and healthcare systems working in conjunction with guidance from that state Department of Health to understand who can be deployed where and how they're going to about doing that. Even within hospitals, nurses have traditionally been hired to one unit within the hospital where they work their career every day. And what the pandemic really taught us was, is that we have to create a much more nimble and flexible workforce. And whether that's cross training so that nurses are comfortable in one or more units, that ambulatory care nurses nurses may need to be pulled from that type of setting to to an inpatient where they're, they're caring for patients within hospitals and hospital beds. It's really embedding a much higher degree of flexibility and ability to rapidly pivot and move staff around as needed. And there have been some really impressive examples of that. Right now, our biggest challenge nationally is rapidly vaccinating 300 million Americans. And so how we go about doing that and mobilizing our nurses and our other healthcare providers is going to be critical to the success of that program. Can you talk about that? Because that is the million dollar question at the moment. I mean, we hear the, again, you mentioned all of those pieces of supply chain, you know, we have to have the vaccine manufactured, it needs to be shipped to the different places, 50 different states are figuring out 50 different ways to do it, then putting up the mass vaccination sites, so many details in this, you're um, spending a lot of time helping to put together guidelines around vaccinations, getting back to school, all of these things that we need to do to resume a life that we all miss and love. Yes, we have looked at, for one thing, establishing fair, equitable, 
ethically justified allocation schemes for distribution of the vaccines in order to save as many lives as possible and, of course, to reduce transmission of the disease. The challenge has gone back to the fact that the federal government can't mandate how states go about distributing their vaccine, and each state has chosen to do it in a slightly different way. And then going back to the Center for Health Security, we have another project ongoing right now that's looking at, we're calling it the Communivax Coalition. And it's using research from uh, boots on the ground scientists in communities of color or communities that have experienced some historic vaccine hesitancy, again, to have them inform us, learn more, get involved in their own healthcare decision making, and to move the community towards a much more resilient, recovered community as we go forward. So I'm very optimistic that over the next few weeks, we're going to see a rapid acceleration of the national vaccination effort. And we have seen a lot of healthcare providers want to contribute to that effort. Yeah, I was going to say the medical reserve corps that are in each one of the states and down at the county level, we're seeing those being activated. And to your point, using the incident command um, framework to to organize across all of these different agencies and responding to this. I think I heard you mention that you have seen or heard stories where there has been success in um, the workforce mobilizing and becoming more nimble and responsive to the set of needs that are right in front of them. Have you got some of those that you can share? As part of another research project that I'm leading for the center, we interviewed some physicians at the MedStar organization, which is located in the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. And their mobilization of their healthcare providers redeploying them within their health system to their urgent care centers to help deal with the surge in demand was really very impressive. So as uh, primary care practices were um, basically having to shut down last year and switch to telehealth and schools closed and sports related team physicians and athletic trainers were quiet because the schools had suspended classes and sports. MedStar did a very impressive job of redeploying physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, and athletic trainers to be able to help out within the urgent care centers or within the COVID testing tents. And again, it's just an example of how do we take our existing workforce, but look at it in a very creative and innovative way to say, okay, these business lines have shut down temporarily for now. We have value in our healthcare providers and we can optimize our ability to continue to deliver services in other areas and even help out as an extension of the public health workforce during the COVID-19 response by redeploying those healthcare providers. And so that's one example of a health system that really did a very impressive job. At your center, you are active globally and then also through the International Council of Nurses. So you get to see things unfold in places that have enormous amounts of resources and those who have very limited resources. But across all of them, innovation is taking place. Problem solving at scale is taking place. In this role that you've had that's evolved over a couple of decades and writing and researching and working directly hands-on, you know, when you think about innovation, how do you define it? How do you know it when you see it? To me, innovation is going where no man has gone before. It's finding where's the gap? Where is the opportunity? And how can we fill it? And I think I've naturally gravitated towards finding those gaps 
throughout my career. And it may be just because I'm constantly inquisitive, but I have been fortunate enough to do a Fulbright in Dublin, Ireland at the Royal College of Surgeons to be able to look at emergency preparedness and response challenges in uh, in Dublin emergency departments and within their National Ambulance Service and Fire Brigade. I was fortunate enough to be able to go over to Japan post Fukushima Daiichi disaster and work with the Japanese Red Cross to understand how they were using technology and simulation to revamp and deploy rapid disaster response teams into austere rural environments that were suffering from horrible natural disasters or the radiation event. So humans are incredibly resilient and talented, and we're constantly seeking how can we take what we have learn more and be able to develop something to do it better. There's so many opportunities there. One example of a project I'm currently working on is I've partnered with the Applied Physics Lab to work on developing a digital disaster dashboard where it would be a health systems decision support tool for a catastrophic disaster event, such as a nuclear power plant disaster or what we're experiencing during the pandemic, where not only are our citizens impacted by the disaster, but the health care system itself is damaged or is forced to change. And so we have seen that with the pandemic, the need to set up testing sites, alternative care facilities, point of distribution clinics for vaccines, and all of the demands that that have put on the healthcare workforce in terms of staff, supplies, space to be able to accommodate that. And so we're using systems dynamics engineering and knowledge of the healthcare system in the healthcare workforce to build a disaster digital dashboard that will be of great service to emergency operations planners and hospital administrators to help respond to these types of events. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking how grateful I am that there are people like you and your colleagues at the, at the center who are thinking about this full time, all the time when there's not a disaster. Because I think that that's the point oftentimes that we miss is that crisis planning, disaster preparation, it's best done when there's nothing going on. The nice thing about having a crisis is that it pushes us to do things that we were reluctant to do. There's so many different things that we're looking at thinking, wow, I wish we had done that. And I think one of the things that's really troubling and a moment of action, you know, you mentioned the social unrest, the disasters that we've been experiencing through the pandemic, the wildfires, the compilation and accumulation of disaster upon disaster are the disparities and the inequities that it is pointing us to. Um, in your your work and, and the, the team there at the center, what are you unearthing that maybe we haven't heard? And then more importantly, what are you recommending? What What do we need to do? What does this moment call on us to say, you need to do this, it's long overdue, don't wait any longer? Sure. I think the most important thing uh, in, in one of the projects I was working on, I had the great privilege of talking with Dr. Lloyd Mishner, who was at Duke School of Medicine, and he and Dr. Michael McDonald started something called the Resilient American Communities Initiative. And it's really looking at how do you put the community in the center and have primary care partner with community-based organizations where there are trusted individuals to help optimize the delivery of public health interventions for COVID-19 and at the same time to deliver primary care services to those patients and families who need them the most. And so I'm excited about that initiative because it's trying to build from the grassroots up 
basically a system of systems recognizing that a lot of our public health interventions for COVID, getting people to mask, getting them to limit how many people they get together with, having them accept and get the vaccine, those initiatives are built at the speed of trust. People are only going to do what they trust is going to be in their best interests. And so uh, that's an example of just a really wonderful initiative. I work with a group of wonderful colleagues. We all did a Robert Wood Johnson Executive Nurse Fellowship many years ago. And from that Executive Nurse Fellowship, the Alumni Association that was formed from it is called Nurse Trust. And I'm working now to do sort of the match.com between the resilient American communities and this wonderful network of really talented executive nurse leaders across the country to try to pull those groups together to see how the knowledge and skills of these executive nurse leaders may be able to help advance the work of these resilient American communities. So what's really joyful for me in a lot of my work, it's not always having to come up with something new or better. It's often identifying the talent and treasure that we have already within our workforce, within our organizations, and make those connections where you really can see synergy and advance a lot of these public health initiatives. What are some of the, you know, when you think about partnerships that there's some that seem obvious and some data sources that seem obvious, are there any that have surprised you that really helped us to better understand things that we might not have thought of? Or like I said, the ones that surprised you that we should be tapping into more. Something you said triggered my thinking about a project that we're working on as it relates to next generation respiratory protection. That's a project that's looking at making connections, not just between regulators and manufacturers and testing laboratories, but also with the healthcare systems and the healthcare workers who will be purchasing and wearing some of that personal protective equipment. In many ways, the genesis of this project was the knowledge that we've been using the same type of surgical masks for 30 or 40 years. There hasn't been a lot of innovation in respiratory protection for healthcare workers, and certainly we We've never needed it for the public before. It's not been a cultural norm as it has been in some of the Asian countries following SARS for people to need to wear a face mask or some type of respiratory protection as they go through their daily lives or work. And so how do we make connections to understand where there is innovations in research and design to encourage healthcare workers to potentially accept new types of masks or respirators that they were not either familiar with or they had never used before. Going forward, better fitting, more comfortable and more effective respiratory protection is going to become increasingly more important as we do have other types of emerging infectious diseases. And then we still have unresolved issues in the country right now about How do we get people to mask, to wear the right mask? What are we going to do for small children or the frail elderly who really struggle to mask? That's an important arena where the only way we're going to solve some of these issues is by making those connections and having people who previously had been pretty siloed in their work come together and work collaboratively to find innovative solutions to this challenge. Yeah, I was going to say, where's Darth Vader when you need a mask-wearing role model? You know? <laughs> right, exactly. We're going to have to tap into some of those. Yeah. Uh, the, the two questions that are um, on my heart at the moment, really. Tenor, what keeps you up at night? I mean, you're clearly curious. What's the thing, as far as disasters coming together, that scares you to a point of not being able to sleep? What do we need to be mindful and thinking about that drives our planning? 
Oh, that's that's a really good question, Shauna. And the things that keep me up at night aren't so much the ominous foreboding, falling off the cliff into a disaster of, of such extent that we can't even begin to think of it. What really keeps me up at night is more a frustration level when we have the knowledge and we have the science to be able to stop things such as the spread of SARS-CoV-2 virus and that people aren't paying attention to that. So I think what bothers me more is just frustration with a lack of understanding and an appreciation for the value of science to play such a powerful role in improving all of our lives. The one thing that we all share in common right now, and it doesn't matter what you believe in, but people are tired. They're tired. They're lonely. They're sad. They're anxious. They've had the world as they know it turned upside down, and they have been by themselves for much longer than anyone ever imagined we would be. And so there are such easy solutions to trying to turn this around within the next four to six weeks if people would all just adopt those measures and pay attention. So I guess that's probably the one thing that troubles me the most. In true confession, some nights I just don't sleep because I think about all these things so much that it becomes kind of hard to shut it off. But I'll just wake up and rub the heads of my two puppies and get a cup of tea and read a book. And and, uh, that's that. And then get back to work. Yeah. Yeah. And on a more uplifting note, clearly you are deep in the, the dangers and the despair of disaster. But in those moments of disaster, there's some really beautiful moments of humanity, courage, and decency. What are some of those things that you've seen that help you to know that while hard things are hard, people are good and we will, we have, we have endured very difficult things. We've solved really big problems. We're going to solve this. We're going to get out of it. I'm just curious what it is that you see and what it is that you know that gives you confidence and can give the rest of us confidence. Oh, I think we've seen so many wonderful, amazing examples. And I'm going to go broad with this one. First and foremost, just the 10,000 scientists across the United States and the world that pulled together to develop these vaccines. That's a major accomplishment. And they built the vaccine platforms on the work of many scientists who had done vaccine work leading up to this year. So that was a collective, amazing scientific effort. And I stand in awe of all of those individuals who contributed to that. We've seen the power of the healthcare workforce to respond to overwhelming surge in three huge waves of this pandemic. We've seen public health officials who have been vilified and even experienced personal threats to their safety as they tried to carry forth their message of using science and known public health interventions to stop the disease. And I stand in awe of all of my public health colleagues who I've been so blessed to work with. And then finally, just the power of families and friends and the love that people have shown to those who've lost loved ones, to those who've lost their jobs, to the strength of the mothers who've been homeschooling children and trying to keep their place in the workforce. I have seen so many inspiring stories of humanity. The people who are working to strengthen and build resilience within our communities and to get ahead of this pandemic. We're at a good time right now, today, the end of February. Our new cases are dropping, hospitalizations are dropping. We don't have a crystal ball to know if this means we have gotten ahead of the pandemic, but I have seen amazing expressions of humanity that just 
warms my heart and makes me so grateful to be alive and to have people that love me and that I love and that continues to drive my work and then the joy of working with so many committed colleagues who share my passion and commitment to try to get us through this. Well, that that is a real lift to my heart and my spirits because it's been a really tough pandemic. When I hear you say those things, Tenor, at those moments where you feel like you just can't go on, hearing those words and being reminded of people who love you, people who care, people who are willing to help the strangers who will bring you food, who will give you a blanket, we're going to be okay. We're going to be more than okay. And I just want to say thank you to you and to all of the colleagues and so many people who are working on these really hard problems. We are forever indebted to you. Nurse, innovator, and disaster researcher, Tenor goodwin Binema is a contributing scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, a multidisciplinary group of wildly talented researchers who devote their full energy to protect people's health from epidemics and disasters and ensure that communities are resilient to major challenges. The world has become far more familiar with Tenor's colleagues at Johns Hopkins as a result of the COVID-19 Tracking Project, an effort that began in January of 2020 as one of the first global maps to track and publicly report COVID-19 cases and deaths. It has evolved into the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center and is the result of an interdisciplinary collaboration spanning the entire Johns Hopkins University and medicine system, which includes the Center for Health Security. Tenor is also the editor of the ominous-sounding textbook, Disaster Nursing and Emergency Preparedness for Chemical, Biological, and Radiological Terrorism and Other Hazards. And she's the developer of the mobile app, Disaster Nursing. Be sure to download it. The next time you're without power and water, you will be so glad you did. Over the past decades, a wide range of technologies and data have improved our ability to innovate in predicting, preparing, and responding to disasters. There's been an exponential growth in the amount of data that is open and available, whether from public and civic agencies, satellites, drones, and mobile phones, or crowdsourced from citizens on the ground. This data, when analyzed holistically, provides valuable insight for understanding the current situation, the trends, establishing a common operating picture, and informing our decisions and policies. On the technology side, Machine learning and artificial intelligence have been key to developing algorithms that guide disaster risk management, response, and recovery. 3D printing has become critical to providing essential parts in the field when supply chains have been disrupted. And drones are playing a much greater role in site inspection, information reconnaissance, and delivery of vaccines, blood, medications, and essential medical supplies. As Tenor references, there are all manner of hazards and catastrophic events that communities and health systems, governments, and innovators are creatively seeking ways to prepare for and build resiliency to. And they are doing so using science and data and technology and a broad range of partnerships and collaborations. The pandemic its scope, scale, and urgency have unleashed an incredible array of disaster response innovations. When Tenor shared that our ability to go happily about our day-to-day lives is because we underestimate the likelihood of catastrophic events and the chaos they create, I was reminded of the historic Senate confirmation hearings decades ago of Madeleine Albright to the position of Secretary of State, in which she eloquently stitched together the relationship between disaster, health, and national security. In her testimony, she shared her experiences as a young girl living through the devastation of war and political unrest, and described how during her adult years and global travels as a diplomat, she witnessed 
all manner of disasters, political, economic, environmental, how they played out, both domestically and internationally, and the impact it had on the health and security of nations, infrastructures, systems, economies, communities, families, and individuals. Her testimony left a lasting impression. And listening to Tenor, I was reminded of Albright's words when she referred to the universal daily goal of seeking the quiet miracle of a normal life. And just how miraculous and remarkable a life without frequent disaster truly is. And during the pandemic, Secretary Albright has been called upon once again for wisdom, guidance, and perspective on the relationship between disaster, security, and recovery, and how best to respond. Resilience. Resilience, she wrote, is the best response to disaster. And when asked for her outlook on life and world affairs, Albright responds that she is an optimist, one who worries a lot. And when Tenor is asked for her outlook on life, she too is an optimist, one who plans and innovates a lot. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Learn more at seeyounowpodcast.com.